Hello, my name is Rick Labuda with Conquer Chiari, and we are very excited to have joining us today two specialists in upper cervical instability who recently had published a very high impact paper on the topic of the upper cervical instability associated with hypermobility. We are joined by Professor Leslie Russick and Susan Shalala, who is a practicing physical therapist who specializes in this topic. Leslie, if we could start with you, if you could just talk about your background a little bit and how you came to focus on this specific area. Yeah, so I am a physical therapist and I just recently retired from teaching at Clarkson University for about 30 years. And I specialized in hypermobility, both research and clinical work throughout that time, actually before I became a faculty member. And like many of us who specialize in hypermobility, I got here because I am hypermobile and no one else knew what to do. And there was just an absolute vacuum of knowledge and a lot of misunderstanding. And so I've really dedicated my career to increasing knowledge and understanding about hypermobility. Cervical instability is a particularly challenging aspect of hypermobility. And a group of us clinicians started talking about what we would do with these patients because there is no research telling us what to do and there are no guidelines. And that's how the paper came around. Great, thank you. Susan? Okay, so I am a practicing physical therapist, also living with um, hypermobile um, uh, okay. and okay. I uh, my my history is a little unique in the sense that as a I went to physical therapy because of my biomechanical challenges, more so as that athlete always being injured and wanted to figure out biomechanically uh, how to better you know sustain. Sure. <laughs> and sure. so got into that, got into physical therapy, and then. I went after physical therapy school into the industrial arena. So I was working more in the industrial, kind mm -hmm. of clinical industrial um, workers comp um, setting. And from there then, so it's all very impactful. Um, so understanding biomechanics of machinery and the human body and how that meshes well together and how it has to work together to make workers efficient and keep them healthy. Then I went into, um, from there, few years later, I had a stroke, a pretty bad stroke, and okay. lost my speech, immediate memory, seizure disorder, and my right side of my body. And this is very important because of the neuroplasticity effects of the brain that had to happen for me to heal through therapy. And, and the challenges that it, it presented to um, when I was doing physical therapy, my hypermobility, my dislocations, my my other problems on my weak side. Sure. So I had to, I had to find other ways to um, figure out how to do my therapy to get stronger um, and still keep myself safe. So um, from there, then I went back into the ergonomic world and, um, you know, it's the industrial world, but a little bit lighter, easier, uh, went into the computer world, taught me a lot. Again, biomechanics, human body, mm -hmm. uh, the computer industry, the challenges of posture, you know, in that work setting. And always stayed in a clinic um, per se, and then and then moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where there really isn't big anything industry or ergonomics. So I went back to clinic, had my child, and um, started to work with this neurosurgeon here in Charleston. Who he's a skull-based neurosurgeon who would see a lot of Chiari, do a lot of okay. diagnostics. And so I was seeing teens um, more so with this new thing called cervical instability. And, and I questioned that and said, what is this? What is this? Wow, I think I have that. <laughs> um, but I'm functional. But boy, these, you know, these kids are just not. Yeah. Functioning. And um, kind of took that interest on um, and retired actually from clinical for about a year and a half. But mainly to help take care of my, you know, aging parents. Sure. And um come to find out I just couldn't let this thing go I had this huge interest and Dr. Patel needed my help because he kept referring to traditional physical therapy and it wasn't working it was doing more harm right. to the right. patient so I started using kind of my little journey and background in of biomechanics and neuroplasticity and then I started using biofeedback but I knew what I needed to do but I had to figure out how to do it so um 
went into uh, we went back to MUSC and said, hey, look, there's a need here. And they the physical therapy department didn't see the need. It was a rare disease. And so they weren't willing to hire you know, a position for it. We saw the need. So I went ahead, stuck my neck out there, knowing there was a huge need and opened the practice, which most That's of great had life outside my stroke. <laughs> But here I am six years into it and have learned a lot clinically, a lot of Ehlers-Danlos, a lot of um, cervical instability. So now I'm mostly almost all cervical instability wow. uh, at this point. My whole practice is that I have a part-time clinician who I've worked with on and off for 12 years. She joined me about three and a half years ago. So now we've made our little practice and in me teaching her and her taking on the, taking the overflow of my patients. And now we're solely in EDS, um, cranial cervical instability or wow. cervical instability clinic. Okay, so thanks. Learned a lot clinically. <laughs> Great, thank you. That's that's an incredible. It's an amazing story, both of you. So let's start kind of at the uh, the beginning. Um, Leslie, why don't we why don't we start with what is uh, cervical instability and kind of mechanically and and how is it different than say other common uh, spinal problems, especially in the neck area, such as stenosis or pinched nerve, things of that nature. Yeah. So the first thing we need to define is instability. So instability is not the same thing as hypermobility, and it's a really critical difference because some of us are born hypermobile. But not everybody has problems. And in fact, being hypermobile can be good if you're a dancer or a skater or a musician. It's when you're unstable that you have problems. So hypermobility means you have too much range of motion in your joints. And you're born that way. And many of us have a connective tissue that makes us hypermobile. Instability is when the muscles and the nerves that control the muscles aren't able to control the stability, particularly around mid-range, when basically the joints are wobbling around out of control. And this is where Susan's philosophy of neuroplasticity is absolutely critical. We're not going to make a hypermobile person stop being hypermobile. But if we can change how the nervous system controls the muscles, we can help them be less unstable. And so that's a really critical distinction that you may be hypermobile and you can't change that, but you can change instability. We can have bad habits that make us more unstable. We can have an injury. We can, let's say, have some illness that makes us bedridden and we get weak and the neck wobbles around more than mm -hmm. it used to. Um, and it's that neuromuscular control, the neuroplasticity part of it that we can really intervene in. So cervical instability, and we were talk we talked about upper cervical instability in our article just to focus on something because that was complicated enough, is like other instability when we can't control movement of the joints. And in this case, the joint, the craniocervical joint, so craniocervical instability, and the atlantoaxial joint, so C1 right. and C2. And we combined the two of them because management is fairly similar from a conservative point of view. And cervical instability is when there's too much motion, and there are a lot of different things that people can experience if there's too much motion. It may be musculoskeletal, which will be similar to instability at other joints, where you may have joint pain from the joint capsule, or you may have muscle pain from muscles being too tight trying to provide stability or maybe pressing on a nerve. And we called that musculoskeletal instability. That's probably really common in hypermobility. And there's some research suggesting that hypermobile people have about a 66% prevalence of experiencing some type of musculoskeletal cervical instability. And then there's the neurological instability where the instability is actually pressing on neural structures and interfering with the function of those neural structures. And that may be the brain stem, the mm -hmm. spinal cord, the cranial nerves, the arteries that serve the brain or the veins that drain the, the brain. Um, and so those neural structures, when they're not functioning properly, present in a very different way. And so the people with uh, what we classified as neurological instability will prevent with a lot more hard neurological signs. So those are the, the two ways that we see patients often, and we felt it was an important distinction because the musculoskeletal instability responds really well to PT. 
the neurological instability is more challenging and sometimes it does pt can always help some but sometimes it can't help enough sure okay so susan um let me ask you in in your experience in treating so many patients um is it is it almost always that there is instability in both the uh atlanta occipital and atlantoaxial joints the skull and the the, the C1 and the C1 and C2, or is there one more prevalent than the other? And then also kind of what's the distribution of symptom-wise musculoskeletal versus neurological? Do people tend to always have both? Yeah, so um, when you're talking AAI and CCI, so you're talking AAI is your lantoaxial um, versus your cranium to, you know, your, your C1, um, yeah, you, you could be worse, like in one aspect, like with rotation in C1, C2. And, but, but a lot of times you're just not going to see that instability in one area. You're going to see the overflow of also, you know, an instability above and below that region if it's pretty sure. at one level. So sure. if, if a patient comes in with like an AI di diagnosis, so an atlantoaxial, you know, instability diagnosis, I mean, for me, I'm treating, I'm treating the whole upper cervical region as a whole because primarily what we need to do is protect the nervous system at that upper cervical junction. And no matter what we do, we, we have to protect because we have to protect those, the joints, the segments above and below. Um, so, you know, it's, it's sometimes the physicians um, will separate them. Oh, well, you have AAI, and then I'll get other patients with diagnosis of just CCI or one's worse than the other. But from the physical therapist stand of, you know, standpoint, you've got to really watch what is causing their symptoms. You know, is it the rotation more so than the flexion extension, or is right. it lateral tilt? So looking through those three planes of movement, you know, with with those. Okay. Um, so, so you try to take an approach of no matter what they're diagnosed with coming in, you take a more regional approach to try to stabilize the whole region. Absolutely. Because again, traditional physical therapy, your patients will come in with a prescription that says right shoulder therapy right. or Correct. whatever. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and you look at those signs and symptoms and you're treating that, but when you're looking at the upper cervical region, you're treating the entire body. I think of the body as a machine and you can't, with the human you, you, human parts, you can't take them off and replace the parts. So we've got to look at the whole unit of what's going on. So if we're looking at that area, believe it or not, um, you know, half in the background that I have and everybody, everybody, you know, looks at me and they're like, well, how soon can you treat my neck? Why can't you give me neck exercises right away? Well, you can't, you have to treat the foundation first. So you have to look at the foundation, see what's going on at the foundation. So when you're standing at your feet and ankles, right? When you're walking feet and ankles, what's going on there? So if we've got fault going on down there or a problem going on down there and there's a compensation at the foundation, guess what's going to happen up here? So if you don't fix the foundation, it's going to be really hard to, to improve the problem up here. So I treat the body as a whole, as a full machine, treat from the foundation and work up, and that's where you're going to get your best results, you know, at the okay. cervical region. So. Okay, and, and this next question is really for either of you. Um, feel free to jump in, but it's it's my impression that from an imaging point of view, there is not a clear... Uh, definition of what constitutes instability from an imaging point of view. Is that correct? Uh, Leslie, do you want to take that or do you want me to go for it? Okay. So <laughs> the way I look at that, I, you know, I, I see a lot of patients from our main neurosurgeons that like me see a lot of this and treat a lot of this. And um, from, from those neurosurgeons, they, they look at things the same, but different. Um, so, you know, I, when I work with Dr. Patel, he doesn't really look at the CT scan and the rotational factor because when he is having to do his part, which would be, you know, a fusion, he, he over the years has seen that the problems, you know, if they just, if we just fuse one level, there typically is, you know, an instability above and below. So we have to protect it all. So who he at this point does an occiput to C3 fusion, and that kind of covers and protects that whole upper cervical region. 
Okay, so with the imaging, he's looking at the upright cervical flexion extension MRI. And again, that varies from imaging center to imaging center. Right. We have a patient go from one center and have certain results that Dr. Patel will read, and then they'll get the, you know, an upright sure. MRI somewhere else. And that patient will say, oh, well, they let me go so much further. They let me go so much further with my flexion extension. And then the results come up with right. even worse numbers. So, so it is very inconsistent, but it's the fact that we are seeing the instability but again, back to the paper, when we looked at it, it was very smart to kind of treat on our end and look at the irritability status because I may get these, you know, BAIs and, um, you know, it, just all of these numbers that they're looking for. But the thing is, I'm hearing from the patient in my history how functional are they or how not non-functional are they? Sure. And that's what we're having to treat. So I can't like, yes, they confirm that there is an instability, but my job is to actually take that, you know, know that that diagnosis is in, in existing. And then where do we start? What is your current level of function and what is your symptoms? And then from signs and symptoms. And from there, we can kind of find that baseline to start with. So, okay, great. Yeah, and I want to add to what Susan said a couple of things. One is to remember hypermobility and instability are the same. So you could have an MRI that shows that you've got too much motion. But if Susan can train the muscles so that you have good control, that you have a stable foundation and a stable base for your, for your pumpkin, then you may or may not have symptoms. And so an MRI is not the same thing as symptoms. Um, and then just one caution, because a lot of people don't have access to an upright MRI or doctors don't call for flexion extension MRIs, um, which is a problem I have in my area, that all the MRIs are done with a patient lying down with a head in the perfectly neutral position and the doctor goes, looks fine. It's like, well, instability isn't a static function of where you are when you're in midline. So an MRI can't see instability. It certainly can see hypermobility. It can see when there's pressure on the spinal cord structures, but it can't differentiate between hypermobility and the instability symptoms. And that's what Susan's getting at, that you really right. have to listen to the patient as to how they're functioning, how their nervous system is or isn't controlling the motion at the neck. Sure. And just to clarify the, the difference between the hypermobility and instability and controlling the instability, you're referring to proper alignment of, of the vertebra and proper function in a, across a dynamic range, right? Yes. Okay, great. Let's shift to, the, uh, to this paper, which um, has been extremely well received, I believe. Uh, Professor Rosick, maybe you can talk about kind of the goals of the paper and um, how it came about and, and some of the, the key points about what it covers. Yeah, so it came about because I was invited to a discussion group of physicians and they wanted to come up with a protocol for using traction for cervical instability because traction does decrease symptoms, but it's probably not safe. And so there were several of us PTs there and we were all like, really upset about the idea of using cervical traction for instability. So then we started talking among ourselves, the phys physical therapists, and I felt like if we're going to, that these people have so much knowledge, so people like Susan, who have so much clinical knowledge, and it is just wrapped up in her brain in Charleston. It is not available to everybody right, else. Right. And so I felt like there was all this knowledge and we weren't doing anything with it. So I wanted to, to get it out there. I wanted to get a publication. I'm a very active in the Ehlers-Donlos Society, so I contacted their director of education, Dr. Alan Hakim, um, who's a rheumatologist in London, and asked, you know, would a clinical expert consensus paper be something that we could publish? Because there is no research on this. We don't know, we can't publish research, but there's an awful lot of clinical knowledge that is not shared. And he was excited about it. And so he and Jane Simmons, who's a lead physical therapist or physiotherapist in London, got on board and then we invited others. And so we had a group of people from London and a group of people from Australia, both of which have really strong hypermobility clinical and research groups working. And there were a total of 17 of us. Um, and the goal was to pool our clinical knowledge so that we could share it with people who didn't 
have the, the opportunity of having as much expertise. And the beauty of having that big team is that we have people like Susan, who deals with some of the most involved, most severely involved patients who may be limited to bed rest. And we had people in Australia who were working with professional performing artists who were doing aerial acrobatics. And so we had clinicians working on this whole large spectrum because instability can exist on that spectrum. It can prevent you from getting out of bed or it could not bother you until you're swinging around upside down. And so having that large team of experts together and lots and lots of discussions to come up with a model that we could describe to other clinicians so they would have an organized way to think about these patients to make decisions. So a decision-making model and what things we need to go into it. We wanted it to be as simple as possible, but then we say it's like, oh, well, you have to have red flags and you have to have yellow flags and you have to. Um, and so lots of back and forth to come up with a model. And then what goes into each part of the model of deciding we think this is upper cervical instability. And then how irritable is this cervical instability? Because that'll determine what physical tests are safe to do. Many of us find that patients get to us having already been flared up by past clinicians who had patients do things that aggravated their instability. Right. Right. Um, because sometimes it's as simple as having them move their head around back and forth. And so we wanted to be able to say, these are tests that are safe for everybody. And these are tests that you don't want to do with somebody who's really has a very irritable condition. Um, and so coming up with a model that could be comprehensive, but also simple was the big challenge. So the, the, the structure of the, the paper, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that you present then to clinicians a, a decision flow chart and kind mm -hmm. of within that flow chart is, is here are our highly suggestive symptoms of cervical instability. Here's common ones. You know, they could be musculoskeletal, they could be neurological, and then here are um, irritating factors. And could you mention some of the irritating factors which really are suggestive of, of cervical instability? So you mean irritating factors, what we would see in a patient who has irritable uh, yeah, instability? I listed, I'm sorry for being a little vague there, but um, in the paper, you you talk about you know forward leaning work and things of that nature that that will flare up symptoms and then the symptoms you know last for longer than you think they would in this flare up. So so what are the most suggestive things then? Kind of what I'm talking about from a from a things that that worsen symptoms or irritate them, things of that nature. Yeah. So we said that there were three criteria to identify whether it was likely to be cervical instability, even before you get to the, the physical examination. Right. And one of them is that it looks like cervical instability. So it presents with the symptoms that we associate with cervical instability. We divided those into the musculoskeletal and neurological, like I talked about before. And then the next was that it varied based on what the what you were doing with your neck. So neck position, um, neck movement, because many of these symptoms can exist for other reasons, perhaps because you have postural orthostatic tachycardia or mast cell activation. And so to be more likely that it was due to the neck, those symptoms should be aggravated by neck motion, neck position. So when you lean forward, your head tends to slide off your neck, right. so it's stressful to the structures. And then the third criterion was that it was easily flared. There are a lot of people who have neck problems, but it's not due to instability. Maybe it's a structural problem. So maybe it's a stenosis. They have very bad posture or they have osteoarthritis and they may have compression of, of structures in the neck, but the neck isn't unstable. And to indicate that it's unstable, it should be provoked easily. So for example, we often hear from our patients that riding in a car can flare up their, their symptoms because, of course, normally people can ride in a car and it doesn't make them feel right. like their head's going to fall off or very small amounts of leaning forward might flare them up. And so 
if it is provoked by activities or movements or positions that are, are fairly minor that shouldn't provoke a problem in a person who's not unstable, then that suggests, again, that it's cervical instability. So those three criteria make it very suggestive that it's cervical instability even before you've done any physical examination. Sure. So, so Susan, from a, a clinical point of view, are you 99% sure just talking just after talking to someone? Yes. Yeah, 99%. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Okay. So then going back. Oh, go ahead. Now, I was going to say, again, you know, your therapy for that, your management for that, again, is going to be whether you're right or wrong on that and, and whether it's just a hypermobility case versus an instability case it's still the same you've got to fix the foundation oh, you know okay. the foundation okay. and the posture the postural alignment so yeah and and it's got to be done very very specifically just not it's got to be done through awareness thinking and doing thinking and doing neuroplasticity training the brain to train the muscles so that there's this circuit going on so that your your muscles are getting stronger they know what their job is because your brain's being more aware of catching yourself and making these changes but you have to make sure that you understand what changes need to be made because when you're hypermobile crawling into the fetal position or a slumped seated position is like so comfortable and it feels so good because it it gives you a stretch and it feels great so if you're not knowledgeable and somebody's not teaching you this stuff you're always overshooting and putting you, yourself into these bad compromised positions that over time do insidious damage to the different structures. So that, oh, that's interesting. That so so the, the neuroplasticity aspect, you know, a standard. Well, I guess it depends on the injury, but, you know, a typical sports injury might be, you know, eight to 12 weeks or something. I I'm guessing then that the type of training you're talking about is a much longer process to undertake for patients. Yes, absolutely. So can you put a time frame on? I mean, it's probably lifelong, but until they can see results, is it, you know, three months, six months, a year? You know, it's different because hypermobile people have very poor proprioception. So when you talk about the neuroplasticity, it has to ride in connection with proprioception. Could proprioception. you just maybe pause for a second and make sure everyone understands what you mean by that? Yeah, so proprioception is the um, your ability to understand where you where your different body parts are in space. So let's just put it this way, like clumsy people, clumsy people typically have very poor proprioception right. and they're just not aware of what's around them and they rely very heavily on their vision. So remember that vision is a sense, proprioception is a sense, the feeling of where you are in speech, touch is a sense, smell, hearing. So again, it, it rides in that, carry, that car category or that area of the brain, right? So, so when you're relying heavily, when you pour proprioception, we really rely mostly heavily on our vision to make sure we're not bumping into things and that we're, you know, going in the right direction. But when we're training, you know, as much as possible, it's really important to kind of take your vision out to be able to challenge, you know, that area of the brain to increase proprioception. And we know that by research that, that we can improve it that way. So thinking about it, doing it, feeling your way, and if you can add biofeedback to that and, and, and really make that training specific, then when you walk away from your conditioning aspect, your physical therapy you know, exercises, then when you get out and you live life, the way you sit, the way you lie down at night, the way you stand, the way you walk, then lift, carry, bend, push, and pull, which are your higher level activities, your muscles are conditioned, better conditioned for you to kind of catch yourself and put yourself in those positions. And when you're not in a healthy, you know, if, if you're not doing it in a healthy way, your brain is going to kind of be aware of that and catch it, but hopefully catch it before it's causing any more damage or symptoms. So that's what you're training. Sure. So what's the general time frame that you will actively be involved with a patient versus, you know, they go off and do stuff on their own? And that varies too. Learning style, yeah. proprioception. You know, sometimes it's, I've had, I have some patients who have been with me for four and five years on and off, um, mostly on then off because it's just one cascade thing after another, de de depending on 
the the number of joints and the severity of the issues um and and the fact that they just kind of need to stay in the ball game it's management but yet we still need to progress um and keep those fires out so so I will have patients here maybe for, you know, my my time frames probably four to six months just to kind of get the beginning hold on things. And in go live life, do, and I, I tell them this, you gotta live life, you've got to take your vacations, but right. you have to apply what you learned. And right. little flare-ups or you know, situations happen like a motor vehicle accident or a slip and fall or something jolted it and you don't know why, you know, or you have a flare-up just insidiously. Then you come back in and we revisit some of these things and then we keep marching forward so that, you know, you're you're kind of staying in the ball game and you're improving and, and keeping what's most important is remember your your ligaments are that's your stabilization system. They connect bone to bone. That's your structural support system. And your backup support is your muscle system. And really, it's your only backup support. And so you've got to learn to strengthen your muscles. And at the core level, you've got to learn to be in touch with your deep stabilizers. And we don't, I don't think we do as good of a job as we should do in physical therapy teaching this. Your deep stabilizers, your, is your, your deep stabilizers are your first line of defense to protect your nervous system at the spinal cord, you know, up to the brain level. So if you don't understand understand how to kick those in and certainly you're never going to feel them or understand if you if you don't understand what postural alignment is because the deep stabilizers are inhibited by poor posture so then you're always using superficial muscles and and throwing once again just is this okay because it feels good is this okay before it, it feel you know is this okay it feels good but we're really kind of overshooting where we really need to be because we're always looking for that proprioceptive feeling of of something and sometimes just balance is just very calming and so the patients miss that if it's not being taught right so that's okay. where our feedback is very important yeah and i just want to to add because i see a much milder population than susan sees so she often sees sort of people with the worst of the worst instability whereas I often see mild instability and I'll sometimes see a teenager and it may only take two or three visits where, you know, I explain to them that letting your head hang off and wobbling around is not good for you. And, you know, especially if they're athletic already. So I had a young lady who was a horseback rider and she understood what posture was about. She just didn't realize why it was important. And I just needed to teach her that. And she had enough body awareness that, that Susan is talking about that once she understood why it was was important she was good to go a couple of visits and she was back you know bouncing around on her horse so it is hugely variable how long it takes it might be just a couple of visits it might be a really long complicated process circling back to the paper for a moment so we talked about kind of the uh, the evaluation from a, a, a symptom point of view and saying yes this is a likely instability then you suggest tests based on yellow and red flags, meaning what physical tests can you can the clinician safely um, enact? And then I assume you then also make kind of treatment intervention recommendations as part of the consensus. Yeah, paper. so let me clarify. So yellow flags don't lead, well, they might lead directly into the test, but yellow flags are psychosocial issues that may influence a person's overall level of disability and the irritability of their condition. And yellow flags can exist for all patients in all with all different types of conditions. And we know from research that patients who have these psychosocial issues tend to respond more poorly to rehab or treatment if those psychosocial issues aren't being managed. So things like stress or anxiety um, or a lack of a support system. And so we felt it was important that we identify yellow flags and when necessary, refer out for them sure. or use a psychologically informed approach to care. But, and this is really important, we're not telling people that their symptoms are due to psychological issues. Right. We're just right. saying those psychological issues, it's a volume knob. Yep. Red flags are, are safety issues where we're concerned that the patient may have um, something that's either more severe, like a stroke um, or a Chiari issue, um, or something that we sh we shouldn't be treating or that requires a specialist 
But then we use all of this information, the history, the subjective symptoms, the yellow flags and red flags to make a decision about what tests are likely to be safe to do. And this is where I think the paper is innovative. I've never seen this in all the, the decision making models I've seen. I've never seen a guideline to help you decide which physical tests are safe. And this came up because the clinicians in our team over and over again would say, I wouldn't do that test with a person who had an irritable right, neck. Right. Um, and we don't learn it this way in PT school. We would say, oh, well, the first thing, you know, you, yeah, you can look at them, but then you would have them do range of motion because, of course, that's such a safe thing to do. Well, in these patients, it's not a safe thing to do if they're really unstable. And so we don't want patients to get irritated by a physical exam that's inappropriate. And so one of the innovative things in our model is that we we triage the testing based on how irritable the patient seems to be. In a highly irritable patient, we're not going to touch their neck, but there are lots of other things we can do. We don't have to say, oh, I can't evaluate you. We just, we might do reflexes in the hands and the feet. Um, we can certainly be observing them. And so there are certain tests that are safe in the highly irritable patient, more that you can do with moderate irritability. And then you can do lots of things with people with low irritability. And then based on that information, again, identifying red flags when we need to send them out to another specialist and when we can go ahead and treat them or maybe co-treat them while they're going to go out and Excuse see me. another specialist. And then using that irritability to select interventions, again, the highly irritable conditions, you probably aren't going to have them do next stuff right away. It's probably going to have to work from that foundation up or teaching them how to protect their body until things calm down again. And so using the evaluation information to triage the intervention. Okay, great. Thanks. So from a practical point of view, um, what should patients do with this consensus statement? Not everyone lives near a, a specialist such as yourselves, right? So what, what can they do with this? Well, I wrote a patient summary of the paper, which has some of the most important parts for patients of how to recognize whether you might have cervical instability and some of the basics of what is safe for everybody to do to take care of them. Things that Susan was just talking about of becoming more aware of your alignment and your biomechanics, how you can take care of your neck, not tip it forward when you're brushing your teeth, but make sure you keep your neck aligned. And so those patient guidelines are a good entry point for patients to better understand what might be going on and what they can do to take care of themselves. But the, patient, the paper is accessible full text online, thanks to the Ehlers-Donlos Society support. So they paid to make the paper available for free to everybody. And we've heard of a lot of patients printing it out and bringing it to their therapist or their sure. doctor and saying, sure. This really feels like me. I mean, this feels like it's just my my autobiography. What do you think? Can we look into this? And so we've had a lot of or heard of a lot of patients bringing this to their provider and creating a discussion of might this be what's going on? Right. So you would encourage patients to do that. And as they're looking for a, a maybe a physical therapist to work with. Um, are there any are it sub specializations in physical therapy that they should pay attention to? Any certifications? Not yet. Um, although some of us are talking about trying to create one for hypermobility. So ask me again in five years. But the Ehlers Donlow Society does have a list of providers that are EDS knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And so that's a good starting point. When people ask me, I always say, have you gone to the website and look to see if there's anybody in your area and any provider in your area, whether, you know, if I'm looking for a doctor, but I only find a physical therapist, well, go to the physical therapist and ask the physical therapist what doctors they would recommend. So that's a starting point. But in the United States in particular, we've done a really poor job of educating both physicians and physical therapists about hypermobility, that there's been this misconception that it's a really rare condition, only one in 5,000 people, when we now realize it may be as many as 10 to 20% of people are hypermobile. Not all of them will be symptomatic, right. but 
all of them are at risk of developing symptoms. And so in the US, there's virtually no training on hypermobility, either for doctors or physical therapists, because we just haven't quite recognized that these patients are showing up in the provider offices. They just haven't been diagnosed with their hypermobility. I saw a young lady yesterday who's had problems since she was nine years old. And I said, why are you here? She's like, I have no idea. The doctor told me to come. Well, it turns out she's hypermobile. She's got POTS. She's got mast cell activation. She started crying in the evaluation because I said, everything you say is can be explained by this sure. trifecta. And, you know, she had had these problems for 20, almost 20 years and been told she was crazy, told that it was all in her head, that she was overreacting, that she just needed to get her life together. Um, and so we just have to do a better job of educating doctors, nurses, PAs, PTs. And that's why it's, it's wonderful that you're doing this um, this podcast to educate more people because the more providers that are educated, the more patients who are educated, the better treatment people can get. Sure. All right. Uh, one more thing or one more topic, I guess, Susan, I'd like to, to bring it back around to Chiari a little bit. And, um, you know, our research shows that, that about 10 to 12 percent of Chiari patients also have uh, Diagnosed DDS. There, there could certainly be more that is that is undiagnosed, but it's it's clearly not you know fifty or seventy or one hundred percent. There's a large selection of Chiari patients, but at the same time, our research also shows that eighty percent of adult women with Chiari have moderate to complete neck related disability. So I guess my question to you is: You see a lot of patients refer to you from the neuro neurosurgeon. Do you see Chiari patients? with these disabling neck issues that are not hypermobile. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and you know I that's it's important to know um, when they you know come into my office that they have the diagnosis of Chiari as well. Their local neurosurgeon wants to do a Chiari decompression, but yet, oh by the way, I'm hypermobile and I also have Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Right. So so you know, a lot of these also come to me after a decompression, but yet their symptoms haven't changed. So what do we do with that? Again, you know, for me on my end, it's again, treating the biomechanic aspect, because if you look at the biomechanics of the cerebellar tonsils and the brainstem kind of coming through the frame and magnum, and then if there's extra instability going on, and again, the the spinal cord, if that's tight and pulling down, that's pulling all of those critical structures kind of down into that area. And then, oh, by the way, we have cell phones, <laughs> you know, that everybody's looking down these days. Um, and that's just more, you know, it's cumulative pressure and damage over time with a lot of stuff kind of kinked down in there. So again, it's treating biomechanics, but, but it also like, Leslie just brought up the the secondary issues that come with upper cervical instability, mast cell, you know, um, POTS or dysautonomia coming from that. And then Chiari, they still all have to be medically independently treated to treat oh, those course. Things to get things under yeah, control. But I guess from a from a intervention point of view in, in your clinic is, you know, is it is it almost identical? someone with Chiari but not EDS or is it you know is it a lot different is it similar is it different is it the same it's similar it's it's similar and the same in a way I might if they're you know if they're Chiari and just slightly hypermobile again we'll move through you know the, mm -hmm. the methodology a little faster because they're they're not as sensitive to certain things um, but one that is very symptomatic, again, they're treated very much the same as your upper cervical. I'm looking at that whole thing as right. mechanically as the same thing. Yes. And do you think that the um, that the surgical treatment for Chiari, the, the posterior fossa decompression, which does involve almost always a, a partial laminectomy of at least the first vertebrae and also, you know, dissecting the the muscles back there, the suboccipital muscles to get at it. Do you think that in and of itself can be destabilizing? I so that's my question as well. And I okay. want to, 
You know, yes, that that does concern me when I treat clinically. So this is my clinical evidence that, yes, you know, I, I feel it is. I don't know for sure if it is, but I'm listening to my patients and I'm hearing their it, it takes a little longer and a little more. You got to take things a little slower with these patients. And and yes, I do wonder, again, I'm only five and a half years in really clinically seeing a lot of this, especially over the last three and a half years, maybe. Um, so yeah, you know, hopefully we'll know more um, as time comes and I'm starting my PhD, hopefully in the oh, end of great. the year. So hopefully we'll get some research going on in this arena, you know, and we'll get to see a little more and, and we can study it a little more, so. Yeah. All right, well, I wanna thank you both for your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your I'm interest. Gonna...